Welcome to The Exchange. I'm Dan Riley. The Exchange is a streaming internet talk show and podcast of interviews with noteworthy people about their lives, ideas, and current events. This week, I sit down with Stanford professor Thomas Sudhoff. During our conversation, Thomas talks about growing up in Germany, his interests in the brain, and the discoveries that led to his being awarded the 2013 Nobel Prize. All right, Tom. Well, first, just wanted to thank you so much for taking some time, and uh, welcome to the exchange. Thank you. So, first question I'd love to uh, talk to you about. I know in, in doing some research about your personal background that uh, you grew up in Germany in uh, in the fifties, I, I believe, and would love to learn, I guess, to start sort of what what Germany was like at that time, not long after World War II, uh, sort of the, the nexus of the separation between the Western and Eastern world. What, what was Germany like where, where you grew up? I was born in 1955, at the very end of 1955. I believe in the 50s, the aftermaths of World War II, were still extremely strong. They felt everywhere. My first conscious memories of sort of historical context came from seeing bombed out buildings which were quite um, frequently observed then and some of which have been retained up to now as a kind of memory. The other context, sort of historical memories, come from um, evacuations that happen actually to this day because of uh, bombs that are still found in the ground and that didn't explode when they were dropped. Um, So that happens to this day, which is kind of amazing. My family background is complicated. I have reflected on this, in fact, in some of my biographical writing, for example, for the Nobel website, because my on my mother's side I come from a uh, sort of, let's say, an outsider background, um, a philosophical um, direction that was uh, prosecuted by the Nazis, whereas from my father's background I come from a, a conforming uh, family uh, that um, did rather well under the Nazis. And so um, I more or less heard the arguments from both sides. Was that historic context uh, influential for you when you were young? Was it an open conversation in the home, or was it at that time sort of a, a hushed subject among family members? It was not a hushed subject at all. I think in Germany there is a very open discussion about the time of the Nazis and I believe that there is a general um, agreement that um, that was one of the worst episodes in the history of mankind in terms of the ideologically motivated killings of so many different types of people. Obviously the Jews, but it wasn't only the Jews. There were many other types of people, gypsies, homosexuals, and and and, who were indiscriminately basically murdered. And that remains an open wound to the state. So that was discussed very much. However, on my mother's side, my grandparents were still alive when I grew up. And I remember many discussions with these grandparents who were prosecuted under the Nazis, who had to quit their jobs, who were put into labor camps, while they were trying to, at the same time, take care of their children, including my mother. But nevertheless, 
these perspectives, somewhat surprisingly, of these people who um, had to give up their, their um, basically their beliefs and everything out there. They didn't give up beliefs. They had to basically give up everything they used to do in order to um, practice their beliefs. Um, nevertheless, these people um, felt that extremely angry at the Nazis, but they were not at all cognizant of what really was happening. So in many cases nowadays, I hear that everybody in Germany should have known what was happening. But I know from the stories of my grandparents who had no reason to, um, and being themselves victims, had no reasons to deny knowledge, um, that the country at that time must have been quite um, well covered by propaganda and hiding of information and so on, which makes me, among others, believe that it's incredibly important to fight for open information as much as possible, even now in this country. Did you always have an aptitude for science? Was that something that you gravitated towards from a young age, or was that something you, you sort of discovered later in your academic career? I had no interest in science when I grew up, whatsoever. Um, I was more interested in the arts and history and uh, the humanities in general. I only became interested in science when I was in medical school and realized that one, that as a medical doctor, it was impossible to actually treat people for many of the diseases, as it is up to this date because we simply don't know how these diseases develop. And that really led me to science. I know after getting uh, degrees in, in Germany, you ended up in, in the U.S., in, in Dallas. What's the story there? What, what made you interested in coming to the U.S.? How did you end up in Dallas? When I was in medical school, I initially did not intend to become a neuroscientist who studies the brain, but instead was interested in diseases related to the heart, to in atherosclerosis. And after I had done an internship, I decided that I wanted to pursue a career in academic medicine, in clinical medicine, in fact. And in that pathway, it would would be part, it was part of my training would, uh, to actually learn how to do science in that area at a place that hopefully would be the best. And I looked around and I decided that Dallas was the best place to actually learn that type of science because there were two investigators there Joe Goldstein and Mike Brown, who um, were doing fantastic work, admirable work. And that was why I decided to go there to basically train with these people. That's why I came. And was the interest always in the brain? Was the interest always in, in neuroscience, or did it fluctuate? I know you mentioned that you, you studied, I believe it was cholesterol uh, at one point. H how did, how did the, the interest pivot to, to the brain and to neuroscience? When I was a postdoc with Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein, um, I thought that what I was working on there was really fascinating, it was interesting, I loved it. Um, it was very exciting, in fact. Brown and Goldstein uh, were awarded a Nobel Prize when I was there. But when I thought about my future, I decided not to go into clinical medicine after all, but to stay in science. And I was offered positions so quite a few places, including in Dallas itself, and I decided to stay in Dallas. But I wanted to work on something new because I thought that um, it wasn't possible to improve on Brown and Goldstein. They were so good. What's the point? <laughs> so, so as I looked around for 
things that we don't understand and that we need to understand. And understanding the brain is still something that we don't understand. The brain is still something we don't understand, we need to understand. But it wasn't even, even then, it was, uh, then it was even more so something we needed to understand, we didn't understand. So I decided to work on the brain. And the part of the brain that you started to, to work on and, and that ended up uh, re- you receiving the Nobel Prize for, as, I understand, as my understanding is the, the presynaptic neurons, the, the chemistry behind the presynaptic neurons. And, and correct me there where, where I'm wrong, but what, what exactly was the focus of, of your study during that period of time? So the focus of my study during that time relates to synapses. And synapses are junctions, connections between cells in the brain, between nerve cells. And at a synapse, these two cells communicate with each other, and synapses connect nerve cells into many, many, many circuits that process information in the brain. And the way a synapse works is that the presynaptic neuron sends out a signal, a chemical signal, that the postsynaptic neuron then recognizes and receives. My work that was honored by the Nobel Prize regards the mechanism of how a presynaptic neuron actually sends out that chemical signal. What is the mechanism, the molecular mechanism and its regulation that allows a presynaptic nerve cell to reliably and very rapidly send out a signal when needed and to actually change the process, the magnitude of the sending out process of the communication depending on the needs of the network. And that was, in a nutshell, what my work was about. And on a day-to-day basis, when you're doing that research, are you going into the same lab and doing experiments? What, what's, the, what's the process uh, by which you begin to try to, at that time, gain some headway on learning about what's going on with presynaptic neurons? When we started, nothing was known. And that was almost 30 years ago. The first goal at that time was to establish, if you want, a catalog of genes that are involved, that are important for the process. And so our initial work focused on just trying to identify what proteins are there at this place where this happens, where this, these chemical substances are released at synapses. And what do they do? And how do they all work together to achieve the release process? These initial studies were performed by approaches such as molecular cloning and protein chemistry and antibody studies, studies that are very primitive in some ways because in these studies you really try to find out the most basic aspects of the process. It was a totally empty landscape at that time. And the way this would work on a daily basis is that I would initially come into my lab and do my own experiments, and as the lab grew, I would have postdoctoral fellows and students and technicians who would do the experiments, and that's basically how it still works. To this date, except that the type of experiments we do now have changed as the projects progress. At the very beginning, when you started to do those experiments, within the first year or a few years, did you have a sense that you were onto something that would become very important to science, or were you? Did you still feel like you were sort of shooting in the dark? I felt that we were making progress in the understanding, and that this was an important progress. You know, as a scientist, I never had any uh, aspirations to win a prize of some sort or another, so that was never on my mind. And I'm grateful for anything I've received, but (laughs) honestly, that's not why I do science. Um, But I did uh, feel that um, 
you know, charting the landscape and then trying to figure out what's, how does it work, what does what, and so on. It's a very fundamental goal that needs to be met as a prerequisite for any understanding of how nervous cells in the brain communicate. Are there a few fundamental fundamental understandings that were revealed over the t- that time of testing that uh, would be somewhat comprehensible to a non scientist? Of course, I think so. Um, you know, if you think about how the brain operates, one of the features of the brain that is not always appreciated is actually the ability of the brain to process information rapidly in a very complex manner. A classical example would be a baseball player, let's say a hitter. And although I've never understood baseball, <laughs> I do understand that the guy has supposed to, is supposed to hit the ball. <laughs> and, and the guy has, I don't know what, less than a millisecond or a millisecond or something to actually do that. Mm. Um, and during this time, the person has to see the ball has to calculate the trajectory, has to decide how to move, has to actually move the baton and has to hit the ball. And we all know it doesn't always work, (laughs) but nevertheless, um, these guys are quite good at it. And that illustrates how enormous the ability of the brain is to process information because that's unbelievably fast and it Not everything our brain does is fast, obviously, but speed and precision are features that are essential for communication between nerve cells in the brain. The ability to have the sort of extremely fast movements is just one example. It's not only movement, there's actually decision involved. The baseball player has to decide what to do, how to. There's a there's a process here there w- which is more than just reaction. Yeah. And um, that relies on very fast information transfer. In fact, that was the question I was most fascinated by when I was looking to understand better how nerve cells communicate because it seemed to me incomprehensible how it would be possible for a nerve cell to actually secrete a chemical substance within a few hundred microseconds. And the way this turns out to work is that, not surprisingly, the nerve cell basically prepares everything into an energized, primed state which is basically ready to go, you know, like a spring that's loaded, that is just about, and all it needs is the trigger. And when the trigger comes, a very simple molecular rearrangement opens a hole in the membrane, and that hole lets out the transmitter, the chemical substance. And the molecular basis for this rapid triggering process consists of the action of an intracellular signal that tells the neuron, now you have to secrete. And that signal is, surprisingly, maybe, calcium. Calcium, obviously, is ubiquitous. It's what our bones are made of, but bones are extracellular. And there's always a ton of calcium extracellularly. But in biology, calcium generally functions intracellularly as a signal. There's very little calcium in the cells. And calcium is a universal signal in many cells. For example, muscle cells use calcium as a signal to contract. So whenever a muscle contracts, like the heart, or when you run or whatever, it's a calcium signal in the cells that tells the cells, now contract. And so In that perspective, calcium makes a lot of sense as a signal. And the way how calcium does it in nerve cells to trigger the secretion of these chemical neurotransmitter signals is that it binds to a specific intracellular receptor that we discovered and thereby changes how this receptor actually folds, how it's 
what its conformation is, how, what its three-dimensional space is, extremely rapidly, and that opens the hole in the membrane and lets out the secretion to make basically allows the secretion to the extracellular side. And so that is maybe the key discovery that came from our lab in this overall process of synaptic transmission. How long did it take? How many years of research did it take before you were at that point of, of conclusion? Our research proceeded in many incremental steps. It wasn't one discovery. It was many discoveries, little discoveries, <laughs> that build on each other. Very often the people and the public think that science operates by sort of you all of a sudden discover something important and that changes everything. Sometimes that can be true, especially in disciplines like physics or mathematics. Most of the time, however, our progress operates by small steps that build on each other. In our case, it took about 20 years until we slowly had built a complete picture for this particular aspect of how a nervous cell releases these chemical signals. So that was then, and we're here now. How much progress has been made in the field of, of neuroscience in the in the last 10, 20 years? I've, I've seen interviews of yours where you said uh, one of the other things that the general public doesn't understand too well is we basically know almost nothing about the brain. Uh, where, where, how much progress has been? Even if we know very little, how much how much progress has been made in the last twenty years, thirty years? So let me put this into perspective. When I say very little, when I say very little, I mean very little to what we need to understand. It's a lot already, but I always like to cite the example of cancer which is clearly of utmost importance to all of us. The research community has spent enormous amounts of time and money to investigate cancer and try to understand a cancer cell and try to understand how to actually basically kill a cancer cell. This process has gone on for much longer than the research on the brain. It has spent, uh, used up funding, which is vastly in excess of what we have spent on the brain. Nevertheless, only now at le there are emerging rational treatments and the beginning of an understanding of a cancer cell. And even now, for many cancers, we really don't have an answer in terms of how to treat them and what's really going on. There is no reason to think that the brain would be simpler and easier to understand than a cancer cell. The brain is likely going to be much more complex because it is a much more amazing organ. You know, a cancer cell is basically a cell that, a rogue cell that learns how to escape regulation and destroy the body it is in. A brain is a magic organ that allows us to think, to move, and so on. And the challenges that we need to meet in order to actually understand how the brain works, that is the challenges of neuroscience, are obviously going to be huge. And one cannot expect that after this relatively short time, with this relatively little funding, we're going to be there. I mean, it's just unrealistic. Very often, I talk to people who are either themselves suffering from a neuropsychiatric or neurological disease or who have close relatives, loved ones who are suffering and they all feel that we need to make progress faster and we need to translate our findings into therapies and we need to move. And a large number of foundations have been established 
that want to facilitate such advances. I t- couldn't agree more that we need to. But the fact is that we cannot wishful thinking, let wishful thinking guide what we actually do. We need to be realistic of what's possible and what we can realistically expect. We cannot treat diseases that we don't understand. A lot of money has been spent on guesses in treating many of these diseases, and these guesses are usually extremely expensive, and they never have been successful. So I think that we need to be prepared in neuroscience to move forward incrementally, keep our eyes open for any possible ways of addressing disease needs. But we can't just move toward therapies because there simply is not enough understanding, not enough investment in research to move forward. There is not enough to translate. In fact, there's nothing to translate for the major diseases because we simply haven't made enough progress. In looking into the next generation or the next 30 years or 50 years, are you optimistic that the focus is changing in a way that that sort of fundamental research is becoming more of a priority and therefore may have a higher probability of true breakthroughs in understanding these problems? I fear for the opposite. I fear that the pressures of immediate results are so large that some of my colleagues, maybe even we ourselves, are sometimes willing to pretend such progress is possible to be funded and do experiments that may not always be the most um, suitable for actually advancing our understanding. For example, I think that at present... There's way too much pressure to go into clinical trials with possible treatments. What this leads to is that there's a lot of clinical trials that fail. And this is bad for two reasons. One reason is that these trials actually cost a lot of money. The other reason is that people then say, well, science doesn't work. It's bad. Let's not do more science. They basically blame the research community. And I will think that some of that blame is right because we in the research community shouldn't seem to support these types of activities. We we shouldn't uh, we should really withstand the temptation to say, well, we're going to cure this or that in this or that time, because we don't know when we're going to cure it. I'm optimistic that if we are honest in science and focused on gaining a better understanding of the biology of the brain and of the biology of the diseases that affect the brain, that we will be able to develop therapies, maybe in my lifetime or maybe in the lifetime of the next generation. But I think that this has to be done in the full acknowledgement that it's not possible to magically pull things out of thin air and just apply them and hope it might work. I think that that is a very uh, big temptation, certainly in science. And as scientists, we need to make sure that the public understands that given how complex the brain is, how big the abilities of the brain are, that it's not going to be easy to understand the brain and its disorders. If you could be king for the day, if you could organize the way that the NIH funding is spent, if you could organize the way that Congress allocates money for for science, what what sort of changes do you would you recommend or, or encourage at least thinking about it in, in terms of having a more 
rational and objective, honest assessment of what, what's possible? What, what would be the best investment of, of money and time to really potentially get results in the long term? I would dedicate much more money to peer-reviewed research projects. There has been a relative decline in the proportion of the money that goes into peer-reviewed research projects. I would also reform peer review. There has been a decline in the quality of peer review. I would institute measures that encourage scientists to get rewarded for true discoveries and not for sound bites. I would try to change the way how our science is published because we are, I think, in a situation where publication system, the publication system has acquired negative traits over the last decades that we need to fix. I actually think that the amount of money that is available may not be enough. It's always nice to have money, a lot more money, <laughs> but I would, I think we need to make sure that the money is spent on real science that has a chance of giving us insight instead of um, projects that are either not really justified or that um, promise things which are not possible. Switching gears a little bit, we would love to learn about the day you learned that you won the Nobel Prize. Where were you, and, and what was the experience like? Did you have any idea that it was coming? Uh, were you eating breakfast and got a phone call? What, what happened when you got that information? When I, the day the Nobel Prize was announced, I did not expect it, and the way this normally works is that the Nobel Prize is announced, I believe, at 11 a.m. in Sweden, which is uh, 2 a.m., I believe, in California. And so they called my home phone, but I wasn't home. I was actually, I had flown the night before to Spain for a meeting, and I was driving in Spain at that time. And so um, they couldn't reach me, and when they finally reached me, it wasn't actually the people who normally call you about this, but it was already the people afterwards. So the call was recorded, which it normally isn't, and it was on the web. I don't think it's still on the web. Maybe it still is, because I, I indeed was very surprised. Obviously, I was very happy, but I was also a little sleep-deprived. <laughs> and, and I was in the middle of somewhere of Spain trying to find a little city where there was a meeting that I was supposed to attend. And the ceremony itself, you you go to Stockholm and dress up in a tuxedo. What, what, what's that day of ceremony like? You know, it's very traditional. And in some way, that makes it rather beautiful because it is makes it even more special. I had won another award a couple of years ago where the King of Norway would give the award. And for the Nobel Prize, it's the King of Sweden. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> and uh, although that's a nice touch, what I think is really the... Um, most gratifying component of the whole experience for me is that the ceremony conveys the feeling that this prize is given for a scholarly achievement that advances our knowledge and not for anything else. And it's given with the utmost care and with incredible background investigations into 
what happened historically and what the actual advances were and who should be credited with making these advances. I believe that every Nobel Prize involves a piece of luck, and certainly in my case, a lot of luck. But I also think that with this luck, virtually always, the people who received them in some way deserved them, and it was a a justified prize. And um, that makes the Nobel Prize better than many of the other prizes that float around and that give a lot more money, but that tend to be more political. Mm. The Nobel Prize is truly largely non-political and based on scholarship and not on, on who's hot or what happens here or who pushes and so on. How has it changed your life? In some ways I'm busier because I'm trying to use the opportunity to explain to the public and to other scientists what I believe is important in science. So I'm basically using, if you want, the being a Nobel Prize winner as a pulpit to sort of preach. Um, (laughs) But it is also obviously rewarding to think that maybe that will improve my ability to stand up for what I believe in and to um, change things or help change things in a direction within my area of expertise that I think is the right direction, which some of which we already alluded to. Last question I want to ask you. I know probably even more so after winning the Nobel Prize, you, you speak to at least some journalists, probably a lot of journalists. What's the question you never get asked that you wish you did get asked? Or if there isn't one, what question have you gotten asked that you thought was very important to answer from the perspective of just general knowledge for the general public? I think that one of the questions that I wish would be discussed more is the role of science in our current society, civilization, whatever you want to call it. I feel that it is incredibly important to ensure that the position of science is understand that there's a general understanding, put it this way, I think it's important that there's a general understanding and agreement of what the position of science should be. Because I'm convinced that this is important in many ways for the future, not only of this country, but also for the future of our children and their children and of the whole world. I think that science, by its very nature, is only about truth and nothing else. And that science cannot be a guide for political decisions. It can only inform political decisions. Moreover, science cannot be used to argue for or against religion. Those are separate domains in human life. But in its domain, science should also not be politically attacked. For example, if the scientific evidence overwhelmingly suggests that our Earth is getting warmer and that human activity is responsible for a significant component of this increased warming, It should not be attacked as a political statement. This is just a scientific finding. It is then up to people to decide if they want to do something about it or not. That's the political side. But the scientific side should be unequivocal. This is not a political issue. 
And so I fear that not only in the United States, in many other countries as well, there is a tendency to dismiss scientific results because they are viewed as being originating from a political purpose, even if they are not. I think as scientists we need to separate very clearly our existence as scientists and our existence as part of the population. But I also think that the public should separate that as well. It's very, very important because, you know, our whole world by now depends on science and absolutely everything that happens. And we can't just dismiss this as in pick and choose. Tom, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. If you're interested in learning more about The Exchange, want to listen to episodes online, or would like to reach out to the show, feel free to visit the show's website at theexchangeshow.com. 